Welcome to a new series here on the Wars and Rebellion channel, based on my book, The Soul War Battles of Macon. On May 7, William Tecumseh Sherman set in motion the U.S. armies of the Tennessee, Cumberland, and Ohio. In the course of the next two and a half months, Sherman's forces advanced to the gates of Atlanta. As the siege of Atlanta protracted, Sherman sought different ways to break the stalemate, with sorties against the enemy supply lines and other industrial centers around the state. The first threat to make it emerge from Major General George Stoneman's cavalry division, part of the Army of the Ohio, in July 1864. On July 27, at 3 a.m., Stoneman and his 1,800 cavalrymen set off from Decatur. The raid was off to a bad start from the very first moment. Stoneman marched his force past the romantic Stone Mountain, standing as a lone sentinel keeping watch over a surrounding lovely country. As the men headed south to Covington, Mechanicsburg, and Monticello, Stoneman discovered that he had false intelligence regarding crossing points over the Okmulgee River. Instead of the supposed three bridges above Macon, there were none. As a result, Stoneman changed direction. He headed south, directly towards Macon. He was going to wreak havoc on the Central of Georgia Railroad. After Monticello, Stoneman took the road to Hillsboro and divided his force. Major Davidson's 14th Illinois Cavalry, about 125 men, struck out towards Gordon to destroy the track of the Central of Georgia Railroad in the vicinity of that village and gallop on towards the Oconee River to destroy the railroad bridge over that river. A small group of 12 men reached the Oconee Bridge at Emmett and destroyed it. Davidson's raid was an embarrassment for the Confederate authorities in Middle Georgia. While Davidson caused havoc and Colonel Horace Capron's man advanced toward Macon, Colonel Adams' brigade moved on the right hand from Clinton to Macon. On July 30, the three wings charged forward towards Macon, brushing aside any resistance they faced. The advance was successful and got the troops to within a mile of the city. On Friday, July 29, news had arrived in Macon by couriers that a large force of U.S. cavalry was on the way to the city. By noon, July 30, Confederate scouts reported that the enemy was about 12 miles from the city, yet the size of the enemy contingent remained unknown. As a result, Macon's defenders started to cross the river and assume a defensive position on the high ground overlooking Walnut Creek and at the height around the ruins of Fort Hawkins. Among Macon's defenders were 600 Tennesseans, another 1,000 militiamen, and 500 Macon Home Guard forces. As Stoneman's men dashed forward, they pushed the enemy forces back. The fighting on the west bank of Walnut Creek continued. Capron's men had pushed the enemy back towards Fort Hawkins. As U.S. forces had reached the high ground beyond Walnut Creek, they positioned their artillery pieces and opened fire on the surrounding. After the attack, the Macon Daily Telegraph called out the brutality of the shelling. 
Thankfully, no civilians suffered injury. As the battle unfolded, rebel gunners drove the U.S. artillerymen from Dunlop Hill. Nevertheless, enough damage was done that a few homes were hit by cannon shells and a building perforated with bullets. Located on the top of Dunlop Ridge was the home of Mrs. Dunlop, which suffered some damage, including the destruction of stables. Unfortunately, one of the Confederate shells hit the Dunlop house, forcing the family to leave their home, a fact largely and willfully forgotten in Macon today. However, the shot fired by U.S. gunners are still remembered. At 3 p.m., Stoneman ordered his forces to withdraw from Macon. Faced with the unyielding nature of the troops in his front and news of Wheeler's 10,000 cavalrymen closing in on his back, Stoneman had little choice. On their return to Clinton, Capron's men ran into rebel pickets. After a swift skirmish, they drove away the pickets and liberated 33 prisoners. In one of the few acts of vengeance, the commander burned the jail. Having withdrawn from Macon to Clinton, Stoneman had to decide where he would take his command next. He tried to escape back to the U.S. forces around Atlanta. His escape was not to be. Brigadier General Alfred Iverson's men had caught up to Stoneman and taken the general and 500 of his men captives following a brief engagement at Sunshine Church. Macon had averted disaster here and had learned over the next few weeks, new fortifications were built on the east bank of the Yogmulgee River, and the next attack was just months away 